The previous chapter illustrated something of the homes and material possessions of the Plymouth Colony during the 1600s. Thatched roof homes were built in New England during the first 50 years of colonization and then we switched to shingled roofs. Through the decades, farmstead accumulates various barns and huts. Piles of wood are anywhere and everywhere. Our pigs and cows wander through the yard and our chickens wander throughout our home. There are no grassy lawns, enclosed yards, or sunshade due to our habit of removing every tree. Our yards are chaotic. Through the next century, our indoor hearth increases in size to have room for two or three fires. To obtain firewood, we cut down a tree, trim its branches, hitch it to the oxen, drag it to the front door, cut it up, and then use it in the fireplace. Our feather mattress is warm in the winter because we sink into it and become surrounded by the material, as if wrapped up in a blanket. But this is too warm in the summer. Some of us begin having a second summer mattress stuffed with straw that does not wrap around a person. We switch from dirt floors to bare wood floors. We still do not yet have carpet strapes or wallpaper. Chemical cleaners and sealers do not exist, so we clean wood floors by scratching them with sand and then we leave a thin layer of sand to absorb the grease and moisture that might otherwise harm the wood. To clean a spill, we simply wipe up the sand. We might make herringbone or zigzag patterns in the sand. Nylander recounts how children would make a designer picture in the sand, smooth it away, and then make another design. Before Europe's industrial revolution had arrived in New England, only the wealthiest of us could afford to paint our homes. But as chemical factories come into existence and begin to mass produce inexpensive paint, then most every home is painted. And soon after that, around the year 1840, we begin to surround a, a yard with a white picket fence. We also start planting decorative flowers around our home. Some commercial villages in New England begin to paint white every building in town. These painting and planning fashions took a few decades to spread toward the southern and western U.S. Between the years 1700 and 1800, the coastal colonies grew into towns and cities and finally attained population levels as great as Cahokia had back in the 11th century. The city of Baltimore consisted of 25 buildings in the year 1750 but its population grew to 25,000 persons by the year 1800. Boston also had 25,000 persons. Philadelphia 40,000 and New York City had 60,000 persons in the year 1800. In the year 1800 we still live in log cabin homes in the west which is then located in Tennessee but moving westward by 400 miles per generation. Alex de Tocqueville traveled the U.S. and in 1835 published the first volume of Democracy in America, which contains a political and social description of the early U.S. In describing a typical Tennessee cabin in a forested valley, he said that it was made of wood whose poorly joined walls allowed one to see a great fire flaming in the interior. We knock. Two great roguish dogs, big as donkeys, come first to the door. Their master follows close, grips us hard by the hand, and invites us to enter. You push open a door, hung on leather hinges and without a lock. Inside, the fireplace is as wide as half the room and with an entire tree burning in it. There is a bed, a few chairs, a carbon six feet long, and a few hunter's accoutrements being blown about. Near the fire is seated the mistress of the lodge with the tranquil and modest air that distinguishes American women, while four or five husky children rolled on the floor. One slave brings us whiskey, another a corn cake and venison, and a third was sent to get wood. I thought he would get wood from the cellar or wood house, but the axe strokes that I heard told me that they were cutting down the tree that we needed. It's thus they do everything. While the slaves were thus occupied, the master, seated tranquilly before a fire that would have roasted an ox to the marrow of its bones, 
enveloped himself majestically in a cloud of smoke, and between each puff related to his guest all the great exploits that his hunter's memory could furnish him. In the year 1800, there is a difference between towns in Europe and in the U.S. European villages contained a few shops, but mainly contained the homes of the area's farmers. Each day, European farmers would walk from the village to work in their fields, so villages tended to be spaced apart by this walking distance. In contrast, the villages of New England were not residential centers for farmers, but were only commerce centers that contained a handful of craft shops and a general store, sometimes two. There was also a public building that served as both church and town meeting house. Several Christian denominations might take turns using this building. The town might have a tavern that served food, and that tavern might have a bed for travelers to share. In the south, there were few villages. Tunis says that even a county seat had nothing but a church, a blacksmith, and an ordinary, which was an inn where travelers spent the night and ate whatever they got. In contrast to northerners, who always went to a nearby village to see a smith and such, the South's smaller farmers went to a nearby plantation for things they couldn't do themselves. For example, few persons could do their own blacksmithing. In the year 1800, the U.S. has about a dozen cities with populations in the thousands, and most of these are port cities. Today, the U.S. has just 2,000 cities whose population is greater than 20,000 persons. The people of those one dozen cities obtain their food from the surrounding farmers, as has been the case for every city since cities began in ancient Mesopotamia more than 5,000 years ago. These port cities were filled with merchants who handled various items. For example, Robert Henderson shipped Pennsylvania flour to Charleston, South Carolina, which he traded for rice and indigo. Remember that rice was first domesticated in Asia and that the use of indigo to make blue dye was developed a few thousand years ago in India. These seaport cities prospered most whenever the plantations of the West Indies were able to buy their products. In the year 1800, another difference between Europe and the U.S. was in the volume of factories. There were thousands of factories in England before there was one in the U.S. The Industrial Revolution started in England around the year 1760 and initially involved the production of wool cloth. Several steps are involved in turning fleece, which is sheep hair, into cloth. Fleece must be cleaned of dirt, beaten, Home to remove tangles and impurities and to get the fibers to form parallel rows, carded to fluff its fibers, spun into thread, wove into cloth, brushed to remove clumps, dyed, cleaned of oils by a fuller, pressed, and folded. Before the year 1760, these steps were not performed within one factory building but were done by a series of persons each doing one step and working within his or her own home. A cloth merchant might buy raw fleece and then take it to each worker one after another in that series of homes. The G's re described this as a factory spread around town. When merchants later began gathering that sequence of workers into a centralized building, the factory was born. Since there are many persons working within one building, ancient water-powered machinery became more applicable. By chance, the water-powered factory and its mass production was the key to manufacturing low-cost goods. With each passing decade, factory mechanization spreads to the production of an increasing number of items made of wood, cloth, or iron. England tried to keep secret the equipment and procedures of its factories by outlawing their export. It took about 50 years for those secrets to make their way to the U.S. to begin its industrialization in earnest 
around the year 1820. Soon, factory-made items include brooms, clothing, drapery, wallpaper, and furniture and such. For example, by 1830, 20% of U.S. homes have a carpet, as seen below the chair in the center. Popular carpets include Brussels, reversible ingrans that can be flipped over when worn, felt like Wilton's, and Turkish designs. Carpet is expensive and prized. It is preferably clean with fingers to avoid being scraped and worn by a broom. The window might be shuttered to keep sunlight from fading the prized carpet. During the summer, we store away the warm winter carpet and bed curtains by rolling them up with some tobacco, which keeps moss away. And in the summer, we might use straw mats from China whom we began trading with in 1784. There begins an increase in the number of tools and decorations in homes. Our homes had contained about 20 material possessions from the time of the first sedentary groups of gatherer hunters and throughout the first 10,000 years of civilization up until the Industrial Revolution. And then within a few decades the number of items grows from 20 to 200 and even to 2,000 today. In contrast, the contents of the homes of the most wealthy of us looked much the same throughout the 1600s and into the 1800s because we continued to fill our homes with the same expensive handmade items. In our homes, we decorate every spot of the floor walls and ceiling. Some of England's exported items are shipped across the sea to U.S. port cities. The arriving items are sold in stalls rented by the year. Imported goods are sold in the city to individuals, to small stores, and to wholesalers who deliver to retail stores in the city or haul wagon loads to stores in small towns near the city. The small town's general store is beginning to stock a wide variety of goods and from many places around the world. Ships were coming into Boston Harbor every day. He would uh, have them packaged up and sent back to his store by way of, of wagon using Teamsters. And, uh, it was a, a way for the farmer and his family to meet the world, so to speak. Tunis explains that in the 14th century, European grocers wholesaled spices and produce, as described in the medieval fairs of the previous chapter. During the 1600s, grocers began also to retail items which would not spoil, and the spelling was changed. Most every New England village had a general store, maybe two. Imported cloth now includes wool, silk, velvet, corduroy, linen, French silk, Russian linen, cotton from India, Chinese silk, and factory-made prints. They sell dry goods in bulk because serving size packages do not exist. stationery section, an apothecary section, hardware section, of course all the dishes, the, the fabric. The fans have been imported from Japan. Every boy's prized possession was the so-called jackknife that was used to whittle many tools. Shoes were beginning to be made in left and right foot versions.
Larkin explains that families bartered for services or goods at any village shop by bringing such things as butter, cheese, eggs, beeswax, feathers, axe handles, hats, threads, and surplus crops to exchange for dry goods, cloth, nails, molasses, and rum. The values of the exchange goods were agreed upon through haggling. Goods did not have to be exchanged at the time of the transaction, but were instead recorded in a balance book. Balances might run for months and were often settled around January 1st. Barter means that food, goods, and labor are used like today's coins. Currency was rarely used in the general store or in any other transaction in the countryside. Any currency that was used was usually foreign, most often the Spanish dollar. Within the home, hired help was not paid in cash. Instead, helpers move into your house and exchange their labor for your food and clothing and education. The hired help became part of the family. Similarly, apprentices moved into the homes of their trainers. Nylander says that, for example, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, additional stalls are available for free use by country people who bring homemade extras to sell in the city. Urban people mostly rely on food brought in by nearby farmers. Some city people kept a small garden or maybe a pig or cow. The price of eggs and butter in the city goes up whenever weather keeps many farmers from taking such things into town. Several farming families sometimes formed a train of wagons to take their surplus to the city. This surplus would be consumed by city residents or be traded with the plantations of the West Indies. Household women performed a variety of so-called earning work that could be exchanged for credit at stores or was done on a day labor basis within the community's web of exchanges. Nylander explains that people having rum drinks at a tavern might pay with potatoes, fish, turnips, butter, beef, veal, or pork. Here is a list of the payments received by Asa Talcott, who was a tailor and part-time farmer. Most every specialist was also a part-time farmer. We can imagine that some farmers knew that Talcott was fond of salmon and would give a higher value to it than would the miller. Talcott would exchange the received items and his own services and surplus food to the other people in the community and the tailor sometimes made clothing for motherless children. In big cities, actual cash is more often used. Shop owners indicate whether they accept the bartering of so-called country pay or if they accept cash only. Less than half of Talcott's tailoring work is spent making new clothes. Mostly, he repairs clothes to extend their usable lifetime. Farmers often bring cloth to the tailor to fit and cut, and then the farmer takes the pieces back home to sew themselves. The farmer contracted with the specialist in this so-called bespoke work. The same web of exchanges occurs among farmers, potters, butchers, millers, coopers, ministers, tanners, carpenters, lawyers, doctors, and other specialists. Each specialist is also a part-time farmer, hayer, sower, harvester, and maple syrup maker. Many specialties are seasonal. Those involving water mills cannot be done in the winter when the weather freezes water. The work of each family member contributes to the well-being of all. Most work provides food, clothing, heat, or light. The family is not self-sufficient in food and goods, but the entire village as a whole is nearly self-sufficient. Within the homes of the community, 
Mothers loan and borrow items and the labor of themselves and their children on a daily basis. Each mother knows the equipment and talents of every family. Nylander says that neighboring mothers trade the help of daughters just as they trade pots. Each woman keeps mental notions of exchange balances rather than written tallies. In the community system of exchange, New Englanders ask themselves, what labor and goods should we trade with which neighbors so that we, or they, can accomplish this or that? In previous chapters, we have seen that the culture of each people, from gather-hunter bands to big city dwellers, has its own set of festivals and holidays, because that is what a group of people will do. For example, one town might have an annual tomato festival while another has a garlic festival. In previous centuries, each European village likewise had many festivals that were unique to that single village. As a 17th century person migrated to a New England community and blended in with other people, all immigrating from many villages, the set of festivals and holidays were reduced to their least common denominator. Few of the old holidays survived transplantation to the new world. That is, if you take the cultural ceremonies away from an Ulster man, you get an American. Easter was celebrated by us Catholics who were only a minority. Some of us boys in seaport town celebrated the November 5th gunpowder plot against the House of Parliament by building large bonfires. Those of us who were Irish would celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but Halloween had not yet made it from Ireland. Every one of the world's farming peoples celebrate the harvest. Thanksgiving had always been celebrated by us Wampanoag. Around the year 1600, there were about 12,000 of us Wampanoag living in 40 villages in what would become eastern Massachusetts. After contact with European germs and war, our number would decrease to just 400 in the year 1675. The Pilgrims first celebrated Thanksgiving with the Wampanoag in 1621, and then that holiday spread outward from New England to the rest of the nation. By 1819, it was an official holiday in six states and would later become the, the nation's most important holiday. Apprentices would travel home for Thanksgiving. Christmas was celebrated, but we had not yet begun to exchange gifts or to decorate homes. A couple is seen under the mistletoe on the right side of this painting from 1791, and on the left side, the hearth is large enough to sit the child. We Pennsylvania Germans decorated a tree just as we had done in Europe. We feel that evergreens represent survival. Those of us Dutch and English immigrants in New York City burned a Yule log and told the story of St. Nicholas. In 1822, the Reverend Clement Moore wrote, "'Twas the night before Christmas." You might like to read this once to look for elements of daily life in its sentences. Some of us New Yorkers began giving candy and toys, filling the city's stores with shoppers the day before Christmas. By 1830, this had spread to some other parts of the Northeast. In the previous chapter, we learned that several European boats could be carried by the largest ship of the 14th century China, which might have eight masts, a length of 100 yards or meters and carry several hundred passengers. The smaller boat here is one used by Columbus. Europeans emigrated to the New World by spending three or more weeks crossing the ocean in a boat. During the trip, each family gets a turn at the fireplace once every few days and sleeps in these compartments. Many children do not survive the journey. During one trip, seven of 20 children died. 
but sometimes a child is born on board, as some women made the trip even near the end of their pregnancy. If pirates appear, all the men stand on deck to show the defense they comprise. This should convince the pirates to look elsewhere for an easier ship to raid. We Europeans make the journey because we are in pursuit of a better life. A few years after arrival, we frequently move yet again, still in pursuit of a better life. Since the time in which we were gather hunters, each and every time a family has moved, they were in search of a better opportunity to pursue life. Still today, we move across the town, the nation, or the world for the same reason. Since the United States began, it has been common for a family to move every few years. It is often found that 25 to 65 percent of the persons in one town would have moved elsewhere between consecutive governmental census, which occur every 10 years. Around the year 1800 in Boston, each year about one-fourth of the families moved to another home elsewhere in Boston. New York City had the convention of ending leases on May 1st of each year. There were so many families and shops moving on this day that the streets were filled with carts and furniture, as if everyone were running from the plague. Western land had an enormous pull on us farmers. Those of us who had made one move toward the nation's west were likely to move again even further west perhaps to the leading edge of that moment's western frontier. Still today, we continually move from one state to another in pursuit of a better life. Throughout medieval Europe, there were millions of persons who had never been beyond the local horizon or beyond the sound of the parish bell. Ever since its colonial beginning, travel has been common in the U.S. and most of it was done on foot. Even by 1840, only half of farming families had even a single horse and almost no horses were kept in urban areas. It is common to see three family members riding on one horse. We typically walk two miles to school, four miles to church, and ten miles to a weekly event. If we walked more than fifteen miles then we would spend the night before returning. My friend Datman Escher's grandparents said that they had to walk uphill both ways to and from school. To smooth the jolts in this single horse shay, its body is suspended on leather straps. This is a gig. Two-wheeled carts cost less than four-wheeled carts but they easily overturn and upon smashing into pieces might impel passengers. As happened in 1818 to two drunken sailors while passing a bottle in Newbury, Massachusetts. Beginning in 1800, four-wheeled vehicles were starting to be seen and by 1820 they had become the most common vehicle. These four-wheeled wagons could also be used on the farm or for hauling goods across the country. Tunis says that these wagons differed little from those made in Roman times. The wheelwright is the specialist who makes and repairs spinning wheels for wool and flax, and now also makes and repairs vehicle wheels as they become more common. The iron ring is called a tire. When cold, it is too small to fit around the spoked wooden wheel in front of it. The wheelwright heats the ring until it expands enough to fit onto the wheel. When the iron cools and shrinks, it is then tightly held in place. This wooden jack is used to lift a wagon so that its wheel can be repaired. Wheels are laid down to be repaired on this stone. The bottom is curved in this Pennsylvania wagon so that freight will remain centered even on hilly roads. This soon becomes known as the Conestoga wagon. Commercial freight wagons quickly grow in size and are pulled by as many as eight horses. By the way, things look much the same in Melbourne, Australia in the year 1841. In the U.S., the earliest coaches were nothing but wagons with a few rows of forward-facing benches nailed onto them. They used to share a box in the 
Later, coaches were enclosed and had two benches that faced each other to facilitate conversation. For many years, a third backless seat was placed between the other two with nothing but a strap of leather for three passengers to lean against. Larkin explains that nine persons squeezed their cleanliness and tobacco into these coaches. A tenth passenger could choose to ride outside in the weather next to the driver. The wind and rain came right through the cracks and through the leather curtain windows. When the curtains are closed to keep out the weather, then the passengers are simply tossed around in the dark. The passengers have to get out and walk up every steep hill because the horses cannot pull them. Along the journey, each person guesses about the lives of the other passengers while they might discuss such things as politics or theology. You might like to read about a 14th century coach trip in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Coaches suffered from runaway horses and broken axles. The holes and stumps in the so-called roads would overturn a coach and sometimes injure passengers. Overturns were expected on long journeys. For example, one New York City to Cincinnati coach was overturned nine times during its round-trip journey. On such long journeys, not only would the passengers fall asleep, but the driver would also. One sleeping driver fell off the coach, caught his coat in the wheels, and was killed. Few stage lines existed between the years 1700 and 1800, but then their numbers quickly increased. Coach travel shrank the Boston to New York City journey from five days down to one and a half. And after 1840, trains would make the trip in just 12 hours. Today it requires four to six hours by car. By 1835, the Boston area had 600 coaches per week traveling along 100 lines at the good weather speed of 8 miles per hour or 13 kilometers per hour. We begin to put spring suspensions onto the coaches. Traveling for pleasure was becoming easier and cheaper. We could more easily make a 200 mile or 300 kilometer trip to visit parents and siblings. Some wealthy newlyweds started a fashion of traveling to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon. Travel in the year 1835 was three times faster and three times cheaper than it had been just 45 years earlier, but it was still costly. A stagecoach trip from Boston to Rhode Island cost two days wages for a skilled artisan, and from Boston it cost eight days pay to go to New York City but two months pay to go to Ohio. By 1840, there were 15,000 freight drivers on the road. They were called crackers for their constant attempts to speed their horses by cracking their whip. Rougher taverns began to appear on the major roads for the rougher travelers who could rent a bed but might have to share it with two or three strangers. When we rented a bed for the night, we found that it contained the insects of each and every one of those previous guests. Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia contained large tobacco plantations that were selling their crop both locally and abroad. The economic prosperity of the tobacco states rose and fell with the price of tobacco. Tobacco was a local crop within the colonies, so it was cheap and duty-free. The large plantations more closely resembled the mercantile plantations of the West Indies than the small family farms of the Northeast, but the South also had some small family farms while the West Indies had none. Many settlers moved to the South after having lived for some years on plantations in the West Indies. The plantation owner often lived in a distant city and hired a manager to oversee the operations of the business. Plantations were producing tobacco and rice for export. Since cotton was increasingly being used by the English textile factories, it would soon become the South's major crop. 
All farming efforts were devoted to this commercial activity. Instead of growing their own food, plantations relied on imports from the Mid-Atlantic region. The South didn't import finished clothing and such because the people of the plantations were making their own. A set of 100 shirts have to be made in time to replace the previous set that is being worn out. Being self-sufficient in these items meant that the region did not have the village commerce centers that existed in New England. Tobacco is cured by hanging its broad leaves to dry in a barn. One of the first techniques for curing tobacco was to bore a hole in the end of a log and then fill it with tobacco. After some months had passed, the log would be split open to recover the tobacco plug. The tobacconist then twisted into ropes as seen for sale in this shop. After adding molasses, honey, licorice, mint, lemon, verbena, salt, roses, or potash, which is a poisonous insecticide. Here is a very long list of ingredients in today's cigarettes. Besides breathing, it's hard to find something that everyone in the world is doing except for smoking. I take this as proof of the addictive contents of tobacco. In the 1800s, people would either squeeze a piece of tobacco between their cheek and gum for chewing, smoke it in a pipe, which was done by both men and women, or it would be snuffed into the nostrils. Some snuff was packaged for sale in dried cow bladders or esophagi. Much attention was given to the fashion of snuff boxes, which were made from any and all materials and in many shapes and sizes. Tuna suspects that chewing and snuffing were done because of the difficulty of lighting a pipe, which could be done only when near a fireplace. Some men carried flint and steel to light their tobacco pipes. Almost everybody was chewing. Every tavern floor in the nation was stained with tobacco. One British traveler said that even courtrooms were full of tobacco. The defendant was spitting, as were the lawyers, the judge, the audience, the witnesses, and the jury too. He says that everywhere, from congressional halls to church rooms, was filled with incessant and remorseless spitting. Women stopped using tobacco in the northern U.S. around 1820, but Grandma still smoked her pipe in the south and the west until about 1840. Wealthy gentlemen began smoking Havana cigars in 1762 when Israel Putnam brought three donkey loads of Cuban cigars to the English colonies. Cheaper and more pungent cigars were soon being made in Maryland and Kentucky. The first cigar factory in the U.S. was built in Connecticut in 1812 and produced 1,500 hand-rolled cigars per day.